you very much for coming, everyone. Hopefully, we'll get a few more through the door. Um, what we're going to talk today is about how brands can help your business and help drive your business. And we're going to start. I'm going to start off by just giving you sort of five, ten minutes on you know uh, some background about how we believe brands can help drive business. And if I'm teaching just psychics, I do apologise up front. But I thought it'd be good to just set some context before we get into the panel discussion. Uh, so you know when people. People ask me, you know, when, what, what is a brand? I think this is a great quote when Charlie Revon says, you know, in the factory we manufacture cosmetics, but in the store we sell home. Because that's all about this difference between, the Americans say the hardware and the hardware, it's the, the emotional and the rational. And every product, every category, there is a balance for people between rational elements and emotional elements. Um, you know, I worked in banking and finance, and that's probably 90% is a rational decision, and 10% is an emotional decision. Automotive is probably in the middle. Uh, I worked on Levi's, and that was very much sort of 10% is, is rational, you know, it's quality made, but it's actually how it makes you feel. So brands and products, every type, is a balance between these two. Um, and it's interesting when there are new categories. When there's a new category, it changes. Because when there's a new category, it becomes very much a rational thing. You know, we go from a horse to a car, and it's, it's not the type of car, it's, oh, I can, I can move around quicker and safer. So all of a sudden, people are buying into the cars. And I look at your industry, and I think, actually, it's very similar, because I can either live above a chip shop with a dodgy landlord that might kick me out and raise my rent, or I can live on these lovely new buildings for people. With lovely new buildings, it's got, you know, I can trust the landlord, it's got nice amenities, nice facilities. But that is going to change, because as we know, it's, you know, it's the fastest growing category within property, um, you know, probably going four or five times. And when that happens, your brand is suddenly going to become really, really important for your business. Because what's going to happen is people are going to move from a functional purchasing decision to a more emotional purchasing decision. And when you think of brand, you know, I think we need to think of, you know, often people think of logos, or they think of a, a brochure, they think of a website. It's more than that. There's visual and verbal cues to your brand, what your brand looks like, what your brand sounds like. Um, then there's also functional ways your brand works. Is it customer service? Is it product development? Um, is it your communication? Then obviously the other side of the coin is, is the emotional connections you get from your brand. So in terms of today, what we're talking about is how do brands add value to businesses? We've kind of picked up so 10 or 11 points that they do. The first of it is a brand gives you recognition. It's a signpost. I know what that, that business does. I know what that product does. I know how that, if you're differentiated from other people in that category. I know they sell coffee. I know they sell sandwiches. I know it's probably really dark in there. I recognise a sort of mermaid thing out there. So it, it basically gives you instant recognition. People are more loyal to you. You know, 57% of people spend more money with brands they trust and they know. And it, it's interesting, when I worked in the car industry, we would very much go from like wanting to get into an A4, you know, A3, sorry, to the A4, to the A6, we'd, we'd get people up the chain. Apple, people just buy into the brand. So, you know, they buy into technology will change the world, so I'll get a computer. Oh, they brought out a phone, I'll buy that. I brought out a watch. They bring out a caravan people would buy it because they buy into the brand. It makes people have a different experience. Um, you know, interesting how Pepsi back in the sort of 80s and early 90s, it was all about do the Pepsi taste test. You know, with a picture of an advert in, the, in, in a supermarket, and people go, oh yeah, I prefer Pepsi. It was irrelevant. It didn't matter because Coke was a stronger brand. Coke was about vitality. Coke was about energy. Coke was about fun. So that's why people drank Coke and not Pepsi. You, you know, the, the stronger your brand is, you can charge a premium. Um, you know, I worked on Volkswagen, it was a nightmare for us because the A4 is exactly the same car, sorry, the, the Passat is the same car as the A4. It's built on the same production line, it's the same chassis. But what was different is one had four circles on it, one had a BMW. The four circle brand had, I think it was a 23% premium on the car. And we did research with people and we called the brother, and they would give us stuff like, oh, well, actually, you know, they talk about the airbags, the speed, the safety. Um, acceleration, the braking, you knew that was absolute rubbish. It was how those four circles made them feel. But also what those four circles said about them to other people. So if I live in your building, what does that say about me to my friends and to other people? So expressive characteristics are really important for brands as well. You know, we look for reassurance. Uh, Colgate is one of the top five trusted brands in the world. Uh, it's not surprising because you're putting something in your mouth. You're putting something in your child's mouth. So, you know, if it's a strong brand, you will trust that brand. And when I'm spending so much of my monthly income on the product is renting, I need to trust that business. 
I need to trust you. So it plays a really important role. Then there's performance and there's quality. Um, this is just an example of BMW, how their advertising hasn't really changed for 40 years, but it, you know, if you ne never own one of these cars, you think of performance, you think of quality, and um, brands can get that across. In, increasingly today, today's age as well, what's important is getting influence or getting people to talk about you. Um, it could be word of mouth, or it could be influences. And if you have, the stronger your brand is, the, the, the better and the bigger the chance you've got for that as well. Unfortunately, we all make mistakes, um, you know, and I remember like 20 years ago when Nike all came about them using underpaid workers in China. BP was obviously horrendous because people died, Deepwater Horizon. <coughs> Strong brands get over mistakes, they get over issues. Um, you know, and when you are within property and you are, people are living with you, there's a, there is a high chance that some issues will happen. But the stronger your brand is, the easier it is to overcome those mistakes. Um, people want to work for you. I mean, this is a bit harsh because I've got Ryanair and Virgin, and it's obviously who you want to work with uh, for most people. But actually, it's really important, and especially in your category where you know, it's a growing category all going after a smaller pool of people. Actually, how do we recruit different people? How do we recruit people that stand for me? You know, who do I want to have on my CV? What is this I want to have on my CV? The stronger the brand is, the more likely I want to work with you. But then more importantly, I'm going to stay with you for longer. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with brand engagement within businesses, uh, and this is about getting a productive workforce. You get, you know, you get much, low, much higher retention rates, you get lower sickness rates, you get more productivity. Uh, but also what it flows out onto is, sort of, is customer loyalty, because if your brand ambassadors, which are your staff, customers will buy into them and you'll have a stronger brand. Uh, one thing we've done before is about brand valuation. This is where you can actually... Your brand is an asset, it's on your balance sheet. Um, the top 100 brands in the world, it's a $2 trillion value to the balance sheet. And it's interesting, interesting that in property, 23 of the 25 top value brands are in China. So, you know, it's Brookfield and I can't remember the other one that's, that's outside China. So it's not really utilized in the West. Um, Evergreen, which is, you know, the top, value, top valued um, property brands is in China having a few problems at the moment, but their brand value is the same as Pepsi. So there's a real opportunity here for the balance sheet. Then also, you not only you, you attract better people um, and more people, you also attract businesses who want to work with you, whether it's purely from suppliers, like you know, finance, whatever it is, but also overt people as well, like this. So, you know, this is Audi and Brugel. And that's, what people do is they recognize as a brand fit. So it's not about product, it's about brands and how our brands come together. Um, and finally, what it also does is it means you can diversify. Um, I worked a long time ago on Fizzy Living when we started, when, when Fizzy Living was launched. You know, at the time then, when you know, we, we thought, oh, we can do fizzy dating, we can do fizzy car hire, we can do fizzy laundry, we do fizzy, you know, all this stuff, because actually you are, your brand stood for something which was fresh and was different, um, and that's how it can work. So that's just a little, you know, a little taster for what you know, we believe uh, brands, how brands can help businesses. But rather than me talk, I'm going to let the, the panel talk. Um, right, introducing you, can you just give everyone a quick one minute on yourselves? Gavin, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, my name's Gav. Uh, I work for Way of Life. I'm the brand director there. Uh, I've worked with them for three years, uh, and I'm not from the um, real estate sector. Uh, I started my career in in uh, hospitality, working as a designer and a brand manager, and I was fortunate enough to work for um, what I term uh, sort of socially influential hospitality brands. So I worked with Soho House, Hopson Hotels, um, Jamie Oliver, and my last job before joining Way of Life was the executive marketing director of Mondrian. And I think the sort of common denominator to what I do with the roles that I've been in as a consultant or full-time is that um, I work with organizations that value design, people, and culture. And so that's what I'm doing with Way of Life. I'm bringing a uh, hospitality um, mindset to, to BTR. Okay. Susie? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Susie Moore. Um, I started out um, a bit similarly in advertising many moons ago now. Um, but I suppose my, my, sort of my biggest, uh, first sort of biggest job, which has kind of, sort of set the path for the rest of the things I've done, was, um, was at O2. I worked on the launch of O2. Um, through to seeing the deal through on the O2, where with the previous Millennium Dome, what was the Millennium Dome, becoming the O2. 
Um, that's probably as close to property as I've got, I should <laughs> admit, in this room. Um, and then after that, I've worked, I, um, I ran a brand consultancy. So I've worked for many brands and businesses, uh, startups, corporates, charities, across the lot. But my heartland is really um, brand, and it'd be interesting to know what you all think about brand, because it can be a funny word, can't it? But to me, it's brand is it's the promise, it's what you stand for, it's what you're doing as a company, it's the heart of it. Um, so I've kind of gone full circle. My last project I've been at Sage, um, so I've gone B2C, B2B, um, accounting services, um, and we've just done a deal at Sage on another property, which <coughs> is going to be the Sage in Newcastle, similar to the O2. So um, it's kind of quite an, quite nice for me uh, to, to come to come back to that world. Um, my minutes up, but I also have to say I have a, another business, which is a pajama business, which is very. Um, different and it's all for mental health. So if anyone's interested in that, it's designed by artists, you can see me afterwards. There's my plug for the day, there you go. How can I fall in pyjama? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi everyone, my name is Carl. I run an innovation and analytics consultancy called Mindfolio. Uh, our first BTR project was actually getting Granger into BTR in 2013. And our most recent one, we were chosen to help John Lewis to enter the BTR market. And in many ways, John Lewis will be the only consumer brand in BTR. Uh, previously, uh, I run, had responsibility for three global brands, uh, either as CEO or as board director. That's me. Guys, we're going to talk about brand. In turn, what's your favorite brand and why, quickly? Um, I'd have to go for Austin Austin. It's a skincare brand. It's a, a small company, it's a family-owned company and by a father and a daughter. Um, and it's, uh, the product's fantastic. Uh, they have very high credentials for all sort of eco and sustainability. Um, and what I like about them is their integrity. There's a clear alignment between their ethos um, as a family organization, their product, and how they communicate that. Uh, and it's easy to manage a brand of that size, but I think it's something that all brands should aspire to have that clear vision and red thread, and I'll use that term a lot, um, throughout everything that they do. Austin and Austin, is it? Austin and Austin. Written down. Suze? Um, I didn't know you worked on Soho House, so yeah. that's actually um, mine, and the reason why I love the Soho House brand is because it's very, very clear in terms of what it is and who it's for and who it's not for. So, for example, um, and the fact that it's expanded and the Soho houses now all around the world um, all have a very similar ethos. So it's for a set of group of people. It says no suits, for example. The Shoreditch House, one of the first ones, it was no suits. You know, that's quite shocking. Very clear. This is for a members group of creative people. Th these people, there are other clubs for different people. Um, and everything it does for its members um, kind of reinforces the particular feeling it's got. Um, and when I moved out of London and was coming back to stay, one, it gave me a good deal because I was a member. But I'd go back to Dean Street with my baby at the time, and James remember this because mm -hmm. we worked together many years ago. And as I went in, the guy on the front desk would say, welcome home. And I felt at home, and that's their whole philosophy, that it's a home from home. And I think they did it brilliantly, and I, th I think that's a, a very good thing to uh, aspire to. Carl, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sorry. not guilty. So you're okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very quick. Uh, by a long mile, Patagonia. I think they are absolutely fantastic, and Yves Chouinard, who created, started with nothing but a belief in the skill set. So he's, that's my favorite brand, Patagonia over everything. And I'll let you answer this first one. Um, you know, I talked there yeah. briefly at the start about yeah. BTR being a very, well, very relatively young category. Um, I think it's a pretty young category. And as, as a result, it's, you know, in the past, imagine it's what's available near me. So it's very functional in terms of where people are, people are buying at the moment. Um, but I do believe that's going to change when the increased proliferation of buildings, you know, in, in the UK and, and London as well. So, you know, but as a relatively new category, do you think there are good opportunities for brands within this space? I mean, I'll start with you, Carl, because I'm always going to... Okay, uh, absolutely huge. But I will take a different tack to you, because you talked about all the <coughs> right things in terms of going to the consumer. I take a very different view. I self-centred view, an Adam Smith view, why these important for you to convince your senior management to invest in brands. Let me give you some examples. How do you avoid losing money in a development? 
How do you avoid that? How do you minimize that? And I think you all would agree with me, one way is making sure that the investor, the consultants, the architects, the operator, the marketer, sing from the same hymn sheet, right? If they don't, you have delays, you have change orders and all the other things. But who provides the hymn sheet? That's the brand. And that's why it is important that you invest in it. I'll give you another example. In, in a new industry like we have got now, and you, you know this is sort of true, there's insecurity. When you're new, it's insecure. So what do people do? We look over our shoulders. We basically benchmark ourselves against our peers. <coughs> a brand doesn't do that. A brand benchmarks itself what consumers really aspire to. That's another difference why it is important that you go for it. And the, the, the third element of a brand, why it is important that you push that envelope, is it helps you not to compete in price alone. Because a brand will always seek value. And price is but one dimension of value. So I think that's why you should push your senior management to invest in brand. Super. Yeah, well, so what about brand when it's a relatively new category? Do you any other views on you think why you know, investing or you know, what you're doing about your brand in that space? Um, as someone that works for an operator, I, I can entirely understand why people think like this. In the sales market, marketing is a flash in the pan to sell a property. In the rental market, there's massive um, demand and very little supply. Um, so I understand why there's a very kind of shallow understanding or lack of investment in brand and marketing. <coughs> But BTR is completely changing, and people's perceptions and expectations within BTR is changing. And I have some sort of facts and data to back that up. Um, at the moment, um, or to date, uh, rental properties have very much been uh, location based. Um, what we've seen from the Gessner um, is that, which is our flagship property in, in Tottenham Hill, is that we've achieved a spread of people from all over London, all over the country. That means location isn't so much of a factor anymore. So people are choosing properties based on their understanding of what's in the market. So there's far more sophisticated consumer out there who understands what the developments are, what they offer, what the facilities are, what the brands are. And that's the game changer, because that, that opens up the whole of London. And so brands are now competing against each other. It used to be what's in your area and what's happening within this supply and demand dynamics within that area. Now people are looking across London, and I can tell you that the, the people in our buildings understand exactly what's happening in Wembley, exactly what's happening in Elfram Castle. And so with this more sophisticated, clued up consumer, brand is now a far more important part of what um, people should be investing in. And to pick up on your point about uh, kind of getting everyone to, to sing from the, the, the same hymn sheet, our industry is relatively complex, right? You've got uh, traditional management companies, you've got developers, you've got investment managers, you've got investors, and it's going to take serious leadership to align all of those people, and that the brand thinking needs to happen from the start, and so I think where people, the brands are really going to merge, like John Lewis, um, are where they're thinking like an owner-operator, and there's a, a good enough management leadership structure in order to get everyone to something from that same issue. But maybe Susan, on you, I'll ask you this, because maybe part of this, I think, is setting your purpose the get-go and sticking with what you're both kind of alluding to. What's your experience and or what, how important do you think it is for a brand or a company, should I say, not a brand, it's just a company early on to set its purpose and go, this is where we're going. How important do you think that is? Um, I think it's critical and I think a brand across categories, so that I'm not from this industry, as I've said, but I've worked on lots of different brands and businesses across categories. And there's one thing that unites successful companies, and that's commercial success. So this really, really is about commercial success and winning. It's really tough out there at the moment, as, you, as we all know, in general life and business and in most markets. But brands, businesses that have, and one, the words brand and purpose can mean lots of things, but making it really simple, to me a brand is the promise of what it's going to do as a company. That group of people, the collective, what it's going to do as a company, as a business, what it's going to offer to its customer. <coughs> and to me, that, that's what a brand is. You know, people think a brand is a logo, and I mean, branding comes from a branding device, isn't it? You brand things, you know, good old, yeah, the iron and a brand. It, it, that's just the symbol of what it stands for. And I think a brand is you know, making your mark 
So that's one kind of mark, but making your mark is actually really making people understand why you are different, why people should come to you. If everything else is equal, people, customers, stakeholders, investors need to have a reason to go to this company rather than this. And what's the thing, all things being equal, is going to differentiate it? Your belief, your purpose, what you stand for, your experience, and all of that is created from your very purpose or your promise to start. You've got to know who you are, what you stand for, and who you are for your customer. And being really clear on that will be the guiding light to the, what you, wherever you go. Just, you know, I think we picked up, um, Carl, you were talking about was um, you know, how we sell the importance of brands. I think in my experience of, of being sort of brand marketing within property as a whole, you're, you're kind of seen sort of down the list a little bit. It's, oh, you're, you're the brochure guys, or you're the logo guys. It's like, yes, yeah, that's all we do. Um, you know, and so it's trying to, I think a lot of times people who work in marketing within, within, within property companies, it's how, you know, how would you advise them that how do we, we, do we elevate the role of brand within an organisation so people realise it's, it's what, you know, I'm still amazed that I don't think this is chief, I can't name a chief marketing officer, I can't name a, a company that has a, a marketeer on the executive board, which just astounds me. Um, so any advice, if there are people in this room that are in marketing teams and marketing departments, how they can elevate the importance of brand within an organisation? Yeah, I have a view. I'm sure you all accept it, but um, I would start actually by looking in the mirror. Because I wonder whether we have been articulate enough to really make the case in a language that our senior execs or our decision makers understand. You see, I don't think we would persuade them, as you say, mm -hmm. with a nice picture and a nice brochure. We have to use the language they will understand. And the language they will understand is ROI over the long term. That's what they will understand. And in that case, once we have established that, and I think Gaff, you inspired me to think about that when we had our pre-meeting, it was to say, we have to share, we have to persuade it with the truism. And that truism is as follows. Logos collect rent. Brands sell memberships. And just then I say that word membership, just how it feels, how much warmer, how much richer it is, to actually say, oh, okay, because members look, uh, you know, they're more caring over their environment. They stay longer, they participate, they're part of stewardship. And I think Susie would be the first one, I think, agree with me that if you have staff of a membership rather than rent collectors, it will feel very, very different. So I think that's for us to really bring across rent collector, or membership agent. And I think that's what a brand is. Not debt collector. Do you have any thoughts on how we can elevate it? Um, how people that work within property in their marketing teams can actually make the people for higher up the chain, so to speak, put more value in it? I think to Carl's point, it comes down to getting to understand that there's a direct link between um, brand equity and ROI. Um, and I think that it's only as the market matures and people like John Lewis come into the market and they can going to completely disrupt what we have at the moment. I think everyone's had a relatively clean feeling. Right? You can launch your development, supply and demand, you can shift those units. When John Lewis comes to the market, I think it's going to elevate people's um, expectations, perceptions. Um, I think in a way BTR is kind of shining a light on what used to be an otherwise kind of shady industry of renting people are going to be making demands and I think there's a growing consciousness of um, people's buying power and where they choose to put their money um, uh, and as people's expectations grow they're going to go with the brands that they believe in um, and you're seeing that in fashion, you're seeing it in food, you're seeing it in everything else and given that people, what, half of someone's income is spent on their rent, they're going to start making demand, demands on where they rent to. I think that you know, a lot of businesses we work, I've worked in the past um, outside property Brand is, is, a, is, is a key filter for decision making within organisations. Um, I'm just quite interested, Sue, to hear your experience of how you were a tele mobile telephone company, decided to buy this big old dinosaur called, was it the Millennium Dome, wasn't it? 
and why you why how how important the O2 brand was in that decision and then actually activating it. Yeah, it was it was key. I mean, at the time, I don't know how many of you. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know how many of you here remember the Millennium Dome and what it was before the O2. Oh, there's some nods. That's good. Feels like a very long time ago to me. Um, but the brand, and when I say brand, our, our, one quote which I love, which um, whilst we've been talking, you may remember, was the CEO of O2. So O2 was BT Cellnet, rebranded to O2, and basically just but transformed itself as a company. So it rebranded as in it changed the logo, but it didn't just change the logo, it literally changed its whole philosophy, its reason for being, its approach. And as a company, it went from number four out of four at the time, of uh, networks to number one. And it did that within 18 months. And that is when I come back to it, it's about commercial success. It's not just about design and branding. That's what this is about. And the CEO, when he was interviewed after this success, because it was hard bloody work, <coughs> said, um, you know, most companies have a business that runs a brand. We have a brand that runs a business. And that was the whole mentality. And that mentality drove everything. And the O2 example was, so when O2 launched, it actually sponsored Arsenal. I think, um, I'm not really into football, I didn't quite well at the moment, aren't I? Great they decision, are. great decision. Um, anyway, that's probably going to polarise a lot of people in this room, but, um, and it wasn't my decision. Uh, but we sponsored Arsenal, and actually it was great to start with, because the Arsenal team played with big O2 logos, no one knew what O2 was, so it got awareness out there. And first thing you need, as James brought up in the presentation, you need awareness, ticket, did that. Three years on, Arsenal said, right, can you renew the shirt sponsor? And we also want you to sponsor the stadium, which is now the Emirates Stadium. And they wanted something like 10, 15 million, I can't remember. And we were just like, oh my God, well, actually, no, well, one, that's a hell of a lot of money, you know, but well, two, well, let, let's review this. And actually what we realised was, it was not going to fulfil anything we wanted to do as a business or a brand. We'd done the logo, but we did the awareness but our whole strategy was offering our customers a better experience. So if you had a choice between phones, Vodafone, O2, what was it at the time? Um, Orange. Orange, thank you, and they've all changed, haven't they? T-Mobile. Um, you would we choose O2, and why would you? They're basically, they're all just a network, it's a mobile phone. I mean, a property market, in terms of home where you live, that truly is an emotional <laughs> purchase and decision, because there's nothing more important in my mind of home than where you live, but this was just a mobile phone. And it wasn't even a sexy bit, it wasn't an iPhone, it was a network. So we had to do something to say, why would our customers want us and stay with us? Um, and that was, what, what gives them a better experience? How can we make our customers feel like a member, a natural VIP with this phone in their hand versus the others? And the Millennium Dome came about because it's actually, it, they, they were pitching it around. And we saw it, we went to a presentation, went, oh my God, this company are creating an amazing experience. And we don't use that word in brand enough. Brand is experience at the end of the day. It's you, what you promise and delivering on it. And ultimately, it's what your customers and stakeholders experience. That's all brand is. And it, but that's everything that your company does. And this company, AEG, because O2 didn't buy the deal. We did a partnership deal. We did the naming rights. Um, AEG were designing this new experience, taking on Millennium Dome to transform it. And we got laughed at for wanting to, to, to do this. And they didn't know who O2 were because they're American and neither didn't even take the meeting. But when we had that meeting with them and we saw their vision and what they, the experiences they were going to create and what experiences we could give for our customers who are a younger audience than the old BT lot, and um, no, I mean, that's just a fact, the BT cell net um, audience was more business-like, older. O2 had a new vision, it wanted to do things differently, have a new market, new customers. We, what they were into, music, entertainment, dining room, how could we use this new technology to do these amazing things? And that's why we connected the brand to this new thing and not putting O2 on the shirts of the Arsenal players and that stadium where we couldn't do it. And out of that came priority ticketing and all these lovely benefits, real things, <coughs> that basically transformed O2 from just another mobile phone network to actually a quite interesting company that customers loved. The loyalty went up 30%. It was the biggest driver of new sales, people that would consider O2 than anything we'd ever done on price or anything else because people were just seeing it on a whole different level. And until the iPhone came along for O2 because it got the exclusive, it was the most successful proposition that O2 had ever done in its, in its history. Um, I think it's still second only to the iPhone. Can't really beat the iPhone having that exclusive, can you? But it was fundamental. 
And I think it's just, and I'm sorry, that's a, quite a long story, but I think it just shows to think differently about brand. It's real, it's a thing. It drives your decisions, it drives what you do for customers, and it can make or break you. Luckily, the O2 helped make O2, but if it went wrong, it could have broken us. It was, you've also, it's also bold. You know, having a brand, you decide what you do and what you don't do, and it gives you that guidance, as I think you were referring to. It sets your direction very clearly. I think it's also quite interesting that you set your target audience and you were very clear on who you're going after. And I think you know, that that you know, gave you sort of clarity. And I think with them built, it's interesting with them built to rent from not outside, but when you're looking to build to rent, and you know, we've been in a few briefings and it's, it's 25 to 35, and you go, here you go, it's the same. Everyone's talking about the same thing. We're talking about Gen Z, we're talking about millennials. And that gets me thinking even more. You think actually, if you look at the recruitment marketplace um, with Gen Z and millennials, it's almost as much about purpose of those companies as it is about salary and benefits and where it is and location. Um, and I think you know there's, there's a crossover in terms of build to rent because when you're trying to target, mostly trying to target Gen Z and millennials, you know how you know what's what what can a brand do to make a proper impact with them? Gavin, yeah, so I'll put to you on that. I think. Um, Carl and I touched roughly on the same thing at the start about having a brand purpose that people connect to, and it's, um, it's that emotional connection that you're always trying to foster with a brand versus your like, hard marketing. Um, and I think that um, you know, back, in the, back in the day, brands were about corporate identity. People would spend extortionate amounts of money on getting just the right logo. And then it became about brand purpose, your mission, your vision, your values. But now brands are about how they interact with the world, right? It's where the rubber hits the road. It's not just, uh, it's not enough to say that we've got this purpose and we've got this vision and it sits in a PDF on someone's desktop, right? Um, you have to go and live and breathe it. Um, and so it becomes about values. Those values need to be behaviours by an executive team. Um, and that's what people connect with. That's what, where people want to put their money, where I go, oh, that company represents me. Especially, as you say, when it comes to your home, it's such an emotive decision on where, where you live. Um, I think that's where the sort of opportunity is within BTR, for these emerging brands, let's say, um, is to create a proposition and a purpose that's living and breathing. Um, it manifests in everything you do, whether it's a corporate respons social responsibility program or it's some social media. It's not enough to just have a veneer, like brand seen as almost like signage within the development world. It's like an extra veneer that you wrap around something. It has to be that red thread that connects everything together. And that's where you get that kind of like secret sauce of people going, God, I love that brand. I love that. I love that. I love Serial Lives. Um, I love that telephone network. And that's, that's, that's what we're trying to achieve. And that's what connects with, you, know, you could say millennials and Gen Z, but I think it's everyone. I think everyone yearns for that connection. Um, I, I read an interesting statistic the other day. It was by Globescan, and it said 79 percent of people believe that companies and brands are integral in solving um, humanity's challenges. Right, so people are looking at companies to solve the world's problems here. That's massive, that's mind blowing. Um, but I think that with BTR, as I said, it's kind of shining a light on the rental market and on development as a whole, that people are going to have far higher expectations, I'd say, for the people that are backed by institutional wealth, 100% because pension funds have like very, very stringent ESG policies. And I think the, the sector at the moment is, is geared towards the money, not geared towards the end consumer. Um, uh, and I think that's where the opportunity is for Gen Z, is to really evidence those values and, and how you behave and how you operate. I think running on from that as well is, you know, we've talked to people, you know, like today, and sort of understanding what potential issues are within, within BTR. And, and one thing I heard quite a lot, I've heard quite a lot today is about recruitment, saying it's really difficult to recruit people now, um, because we don't really know where we're recruiting from, it's hospitality, um, you know, the, the sector is growing, so that pool of people is, is, is shrinking, but you, you look at some other businesses and, and they recruit on much more on value than on, you know, on, on sort of what you're, what's, on your, what's on your CV. So, let me see, do you, do you believe that sort of, if you've got a strong brand, it can actually really kickstart and help you recruit the right people and maybe look for further afield than you traditionally do? I, I, 100%. I mean, to me, brand starts inside out. It's at the heart of the company. 
and the heart of the company is the people that run it. So you can't have a great business, you know, that's where it starts, a team of people. Um, Ota, just going back to the, actually Ota and Sage are both interesting examples. So when I joined O2, it was BT Cellnet. And I remember walking into a room, and uh, no disrespect to all the men in the room in suits, so sorry, there's a lot of you. But I remember walking into a room, and, it was, and I was literally the only female, and it was just a sea of, I, I literally just sort of same age, same colour guys in suits, of the, you know, the, and, and it was just a, a sea of sameness. Um, we then scroll on, I thought, and actually, and, and, um, and we then the other thing I heard, actually, when we started then getting under the skin of employees was people used to, um, when, when it became a two, people had, had said to me, um, do you know, I used to be a bit embarrassed when people asked me in the pub who I work for, so I'm, I'm really sorry, so nothing against BT and the company's changed, but at the time this is true, I thought, used to be a bit embarrassed to say who I work for. Um, but you know now people ask me, and I go oh too, and like you just saw them come to life, and that's because the whole the the, 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 the brand changed, but the values I think really interesting, the values were fundamental, as in the way you do business, how you behave, what you believe in, were fundamental to how you act as a company. Um, so I think there's always the pub test is a good one to know mm. if you've got your you know the brand right and who you attract, who you attract. Um, and actually, what happened with the new brand was actually some of like the old guys, like, they left. They, 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 they wanted the, the bigger, the corporate jobs. That, 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 that's fine, you know, companies move on. And there was a whole impact. The people that were coming for interviews for O2 were a whole lot younger, very, very different, new generation. And actually, the employee, as well as the customer base changing, the employee base changed with it. Um, and there was a phrase we used that it only works if it all works, and it truly is inside out in terms of what's got to work for the employees, your customers. It has to be. I think that's been mentioned today as well. It's the whole thing. Brand isn't one just thing. It's the whole thing. Right, your thoughts on brand driving culture? Yeah. Um, perhaps Two again. Two worth of thought, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you did notice I was guilty, right? I say <laughs> nothing. It, mate. I'm giving you a chance to speak. We've got that much time. Uh, yeah, no, I'll be very short. It's actually quite interesting uh, because some brands, actually culture starts brands. Culture starts brands. Think of Lululemon, Patagonia, Charlotte Tilbury. Their culture started that brand. And you've got on the other side, you've got culture straight jackets. Disney. You comply or you're out. And what is interesting that however the brands they are basically got, you know, were born and developed, they're united in one thing. And that is we must have a culture that 10, 100, 1,000 people do what is right without me watching them. And that's the priceless benefit of culture, right? And that's why you see, and I mean, you are the perfect ambassador for that, that how absolutely essential it is that we don't only talk about brand in the sort of more tangible stuff, but also <coughs> in the more emotional culture stuff. So I think essential. It's a nice thought to leave. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Sorry, can you repeat that? I just practical ways in which you uh, drive through that brand you want to uh, create in terms of the actual end of its experience. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, going back to recruitment, I, I've hired, my whole team isn't from the real estate sector. So I've hired uh, an events and partnerships person from Purple PR, um, some from anthropology, um, and lots of people from Sula House and their design team. Um, and ultimately, um, yeah, it's, it's we arm them with a the vision of what we want to create and I let them get on with it. And some of the events that come through and the programming and um, I suppose all the values that they understand that come through in, 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 in everything they do, and in particular the, the programming. Um, give me a, a, an example. My team ran a photo shoot the other day and I, I didn't know they'd done this, but they, they had used sustainable stylists, uh, uh, makeup artists who only use certain products they reduced all the plastic, and this wasn't done because of sort of like an ESG policy. Well, there is an ESG policy. They've done it because that's how they behave. That's how they what they believe in. Um, and for me, that was like like oh, that's great. Like I, they're not going wait a minute. What's this ESG policy for an investor that we need to follow? 
Um, so that's where values become behaviors, and mm -hmm. I hadn't even known those earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's like arming people with the vision, and I think we're quite good at that way as well. Hope that answers the question. I've got a sign saying end of session, so um, <laughs> thank you, Carl, Gavin, and Susie. Round of applause, and thank you also for coming. Thank you.